Well, good evening and welcome to the Swanberg, the annual Swanberg Lecture in Military History, uh, which is made possible through the generosity of Arnold Swanberg, who has made it possible for us to bring uh, a number of uh, very distinguished speakers here to the University of Montana uh, in years past. Um, I'm John England, I'm in the Department of History. That's not particularly important. What's important is that you are here. Um, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to introduce to you tonight David Avram Bell, who is Sidney and Ruth Lapidus Professor in the era of North Atlantic revolutions in the Department of History at Princeton University. When I first met Professor Bell, he was a newly minted PhD, having completed his dissertation Martin, uh, a dissertation which formed the basis of his first book, Lawyers and Citizens, The Making of a Political Elite in Old Virginia Grants, published by Oxford in 1994. This won the Pinckney Prize of the Society for French Historical Studies the following year. The Cult of the Nation in France, his next book, won the 2003 Leo Gershoy Prize, which is awarded by the American Historical Association for the best book of the year in 17th or 18th century European history. In 1996, he accepted an appointment at the Johns Hopkins University uh, in Baltimore, where he ultimately became Andrew Mellon Professor in the Humanities. Um, and for three years, uh, he joined the administration of Johns Hopkins uh, as Dean of Arts and Sciences there. Uh, fortunately, he had just published uh, his next books, The First Total War, Napoleon's Europe and the Birth of War as We Know It, uh, which won the 2008 Louis Gottschalk Prize of the American Society for 18th Century Studies. Uh, thankfully, he can now call himself a recovering senior administrator, having been rescued uh, from that fate by Princeton in uh, 2010. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Burkhart Fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, and a distinguished visiting professor at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Professor Bell has supervised at least half a dozen dissertations that became books published by major academic presses, including Oxford, Cambridge, Chicago, and Cornell. His doctoral students now hold academic positions at institutions such as Dartmouth, Brown, Reed, Georgetown, and Howard. In addition to his numerous reviews in academic journals, he is a regular reviewer in and contributor to The New Republic, the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, Washington Monthly, Slate, Die Zeit, and the New York Times Book Review. He will speak to us this evening on the topic of Napoleon and the Cult of Glory, taken from his Napoleon, a concise biography, a historical figure of whose biographies are not Nor normally noted for being concise, uh, which incidentally is hot off the press uh, from Oxford and available with his other books inscribed in the lobby after the lecture, should you desire. Please join me in greeting Professor David Bell. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here this evening. I want to thank the University of Montana. I want to thank also Professor John Eglin and Professor Linda Fry for their very kind invitation to come here and give the annual Swanberg Lecture. I'm very grateful to Mr. Arnold Swanberg for creating this, this, lecture, this wonderful lecture series. Um, and thank you all again for, for coming. One point that I'm afraid I have to correct uh, John Eglin on, I'm, I'm afraid that my biography of Napoleon is not quite available yet. It will be available in print uh, next month from Oxford University Press. It is available at present as a Kindle download, but I can't sign those. So I'm afraid, but I do have, there are copies of my other book um, available tonight. So again, thank you very much. So um, we're at an anniversary. Um,
200 years ago, this week, uh, October 15, 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte arrived at his final place of exile, the small South Atlantic island of St. Helena. He would spend the last six years of his life there. Scarcely three years earlier, he had been invincible, seemingly. He strutted in triumph into the Kremlin. He was basking in his reputation as the greatest conqueror of modern times and ruler of the greatest empire Europe had seen since the fall of Rome. Now he was confined to a small, damp house called the Briars, constantly guarded by British soldiers on this small island 4,000 miles from France. His entourage, which had once numbered in the millions, was now reduced to less than 10, a little group of French officers loyal to the end, plus a few of their family members. Yet even here, at what was by any measure the bottom of his career and his life, Napoleon appeared surprisingly cheerful, and he clearly did not feel entirely defeated. Even here, on St. Helena, he was still planning one last campaign. This was not a campaign for an empire, it was a campaign for a legacy. And he wouldn't fight it with weapons of war, he would fight it with pen and paper, as he dictated memoirs and reminiscences to his followers. It was a campaign that would actually dominate the rest of his life. It's a campaign whose echoes would resound long after his death in 1821. In some ways, it's still continuing today. Now, to be sure, when Napoleon started to dictate, above all, to his most fam faithful follower, Count Emmanuel de las Casas, you see a later painting of it here, it was not actually future historians like me that he had in mind, much as I would have liked that to have been the case. Even after his final military defeat at Waterloo four months before, he had still not entirely renounced the possibility that he might someday return to the French throne. And even if that possibility was now truly remote, he did hope rather more plausibly that the throne might come back to a member of his family, preferably his son, who was then four years old and was not with him in St. Helena, but was being taken care of in Austria by his mother, the former Austrian princess, Maria Luisa. And actually, these hopes were not really deluded. The regime that had replaced Napoleon in France, which was the monarchy of the restored Bourbon dynasty that had ruled before the French Revolution, that dynasty was fragile and unpopular. And Napoleon had already toppled it once when he, had, when, he, when he had fled from a closer place of exile, the island of Elba, during the spectacular episode called the 100 Days in 1815, and that had ended with his defeat at Waterloo. And the Bourbons in France certainly believed this could happen. Their police hunted down suspected Bonapartists with paranoid intensity. And the name Bonaparte still roused a great deal of admiration in France and even outside of France, even, believe it or not, in Britain, Napoleon's greatest enemy, where some radicals actually associated the French emperor with the liberalizing promise of the French Revolution. Now, Napoleon's most immediate hopes were never realized. He never left St. Helena. He died there of stomach cancer in 1821. Some say he was poisoned by arsenic. There's no evidence for this. But his campaign did succeed in a very real sense. In 1822, his follower, Las Casas, whom you see here taking dictation, published his account of the emperor's exiles and reminiscences in a large volume entitled Memorial of St. Helena, Le Memorial de Saint Helene in French. And it was a sensation. It was one of the greatest bestsellers of the 19th century, really of any century. It helped keep Napoleon's legend alive. And the most famous French writers of the following decades, Chateaubriand, Balzac, Stendhal, Victor Hugo, to name just some of the greatest of them, would come back again and again to the irresistible figure of the emperor. Bonapartism would in fact refuse to die in France. And while Napoleon's son never came to the throne, you see here Napoleon's son on the left, um, <clears throat> he did have a nephew who did come to the French throne. Buoyed by the Napoleonic legend, this man on the right, a flamboyantly incompetent politician named Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, was elected president of the Second French Republic in 1848. He seized dictatorial powers three and a half years later, and then in 1852 took the title Napoleon III, Napoleon II being the son who never reigned. All this followed directly from Napoleon's campaign for his legacy. Now, Napoleon III himself fell from power in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. 
and Bonapartism as a serious political force evaporated over the next few decades. But the battles about Napoleon's legacy continue even today, even if they do so mostly among historians. And actually, over the past 20 years, they've even intensified with the series of, of Napoleon bicentennials, of which the arrival in St. Helena is probably the last, or maybe the penultimate, before the bicentennial of his death. In fact, there's been a kind of traveling bicentennial roadshow that has taken historians and conferences from Italy to Egypt to Germany to Austria, even to Russia, following Napoleon's footsteps at a 200-year remove. Maybe the debates will now slacken when the roadshow has, so to speak, met its Waterloo, but I wouldn't be entirely sure. Now, in the rest of this talk, <clears throat> I want to present my own view of Napoleon and his legacy. I want to look particularly at the nature of his political authority and its relationship to his military reputation. And I'm going to do this in several steps. I'm going to first take a moment to describe the debates among the historians and the biographers. And there's been a lot of these recently. Some of you may have seen some of these biograph biographies. Second, I'm actually going to go back a little before Napoleon. And I'm going to talk about the cultural background out of which there developed the particular model of political authority that he embodied. And I'll talk a bit about some other figures from the Age of Enlightenment who could be considered his predecessors in this regard. And then I will come back to Napoleon himself. So first, the debates among historians and biographers. These debates are voluminous. There have been, by some accounts, 200,000 books and articles published on Napoleon. These debates have taken many forms. They can be sim very simple. Was he good or was he bad? Already 70 years ago, a Dutch historian named Peter Geel published a book called Napoleon For and Against. You see a copy of it here. Many of the debates relate Napoleon to the French Revolution. Was he its heir? Was he its grave digger? They situate him in the context of European empires. Was he a, an imperialist? Was he an orientalist? But actually, to my mind, the most intriguing and important debate has to do with something different, namely the issue of Napoleon as a great man and as a source of historical change. Was he such an extraordinary and gifted figure that he could change the world simply by his own actions? Or is this a myth? Was he, in fact, a prisoner of greater historical forces? And here, Napoleon's efforts on St. Helena played a very crucial role. In his reminiscences, in the memorial, he spoke repeatedly about being guided by a star, a special, almost divine blessing, about being a superior person. He told one of his entourage that after the first triumphant campaign that he had fought in Italy, I'm quoting, I already saw the world flee before me as if I had been taken up into the sky. Now, these statements published in Europe at the very height of the Romantic movement helped to shape the vision of historical change that would actually dominate much of 19th century thought. The English, the English writer Thomas Carlyle said just a few, few decades later, thinking very much about Napoleon, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. And even before Napoleon fell, the German philosopher Hegel, who saw Napoleon at Jena in Germany in 1806, said, he said, Napoleon is the, and I'm quoting, the world spirit who, sitting astride a horse, reaches out across the world and dominates it. And the spectacle of Napoleon in his last lonely exile itself added enormously to his mythical stature. Napoleon is always compared to figures out of myth. After Napoleon is Hercules, the invincible. After Napoleon is Icarus, flying too close to the sun and falling. There came the irresistible image of Napoleon as Prometheus, the fallen titan. Napoleon himself supposedly spoke about himself in these terms. I'm quoting Napoleon again. He's irresistibly quotable, by the way. A new Prometheus, I am nailed to a rock to be gnawed at by a British vulture. Yes, I have stolen the fire of heaven and made a gift of it to France. Now, the great man theory of history is not, to put it mildly, much accepted by historians today. Without discounting the force of individual personality and ability, we generally try to explain historical change by looking at a broader range of factors uh, which sweep along even the greatest of individuals. But when it comes to Napoleon, things are actually a bit different. Overall, I'd say that we divide into three camps. First, there are those who do still buy into the legend heart and soul. And one prominent example, some of you may have seen, seen it or even read it, is Andrew Roberts's book, um, the most recent English language biographer, the British edition of his book, he didn't dare do this in the United States. The British version is called Napoleon the Great. It tells you where he stands. It's funny, he's a Tory Euro skeptic who would normally have very little patience for politically ambitious Frenchmen, but he was entirely swept away by Napoleon. He quotes Chateaubriand with evident approval. Napoleon was the mightiest breath 
that ever animated human clay. He praises, and now I'm quoting Roberts himself, Napoleon's protean energy, grand purpose, literary talent, near perfect recall, superb timing, inspiring leadership. You know, and I guess he was good at football too, right? I mean, uh, <clears throat> what couldn't he do? So that's one school. Secondly, there are the skeptical historians who largely dismiss the legend. This was most explicitly the case for Marxist historians who tended to see Napoleon as little more than the agent of the rising French middle classes. It's also the case for many French historians who have simply interpreted Napoleon as the heir of the French Revolution. His most recent French biographer, Patrice Guénifé, falls largely into this camp, the middle book you see here. Guénifé acknowledges Napoleon's extraordinary abilities, <clears throat> but still he's finally somebody who sees abstract political phenomena like equality and liberty as the real motor forces in history. Guénifé's Napoleon succeeded because he followed the course of history and brought the French Revolution to a successful conclusion. Finally, there are those who don't want to dismiss the legend and myth, but want to treat them as historical forces in their own right. Not to buy into them, not to dismiss them, but to study them. Yet another recent biographer, Philip Dwyer, exemplifies this tendency. His recent two-volume study emphasizes how Napoleon consciously tried to construct his own legend through art and through printed propaganda. In Dwyer's hands, Napoleon actually comes off as a very modern sort of figure, a kind of master media manipulator. I suppose you could say this third camp is really a variety of the second. These writers are also fairly skeptical. What they've mostly done is situate Napoleon and his myths in the context of cultural change rather than political and social change. <clears throat> but studies that do focus on culture, even very broad sorts of cultural change, they tend to leave more room for individual action than studies that see history as rigidly structured by massive social and political forces. Cultural change can take place much more quickly than something like the rise of the middle class, and it's shaped much more decisively by individuals. So to the extent we can see Napoleon as a man who rewrote his own historical scripts, so to speak, we can give him considerable credit for his innovations and actually take his exceptional abilities into account. Now, as you probably guessed by this point, I would put myself into this camp. And the line I take in my new biography, I'm putting up a little sales pitch here for it, Napoleon, concise biography of Napoleon. I do pay in this book a lot of attention to the French Revolution, which made possible Napoleon by the way that it disrupted older patterns of political life and also older patterns of war. But I'm also very concerned with the, the way Napoleon both saw himself and tried to make others see him and in the way that he was in fact seen as an extraordinary superhuman figure. And I would argue that it's actually this image and the way it develops that is a crucial aspect of his story. And then in a new book that I'm doing on charismatic leadership in this period, I'm going further with this analysis. And I'm arguing that phenomena of this sort were not just central to the history of Napoleonic France, but to the Western world as a whole during this period. That's all I'll say about the historians' debates. Now, let's try to put Napoleon in context a little bit. It's an entirely obvious fact that nearly every major revolution of the late 18th and early 19th centuries had recourse, at one point or another, to a charismatic authority figure, usually from a military background. The United States had George Washington. The Haitians had Toussaint Louverture. The South Americans had Bolivar and also San Martin. The French auditioned a number of figures for this role, Lafayette, Mirabeau, Danton, Robespierre, some of the great names of the French Revolution, before they finally settled in 1799 on Napoleon Bonaparte. In most of these cases, the authority figure in question exercised dictatorial powers, at least for a time. The one great exception to this rule, of course, is George Washington, but he probably could have assumed these powers had he wanted to. He didn't. Now, this fact about these figures has, may be obvious, but it's actually received very little systematic comparative attention. I think this is the case because of a kind of unspoken assumption that undergirds a great deal of historical work on the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It's the assumption that the sort of turn to charismatic strongmen was in some sense a kind of primitive reaction, atavistic, that it was a deviation from the natural course of what were otherwise very modern revolutions. That these revolutions, that, these, that the return to these strongmen had no real relation to the ideological factors that brought the revolutions about. These revolutions, after all, had their origins in the great complex movement of Western thought that we now call the Enlightenment. And if the Enlightenment wasn't necessarily democratic, it wasn't, 
It was still committed, so the story goes, to a modern and rational view of politics and not to the sort of overheated emotional reactions stirred up by charismatic chieftains and generals. Now, I think these assumptions about why there was this turn to these figures is actually rather misleading. Yes, of course there's a recourse to strongmen which is deeply rooted in human history, but there was nothing pre-modern about these figures. If you look at the 20th century, historians have done a lot of work on the cults of personality around figures like Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, and they've emphasized just how modern a cult of personality can be. I think similar work needs to be done for this earlier period. As historians have long recognized, the charismatic leaders of the Age of Revolutions, particularly the four on top here, they enjoyed genuine popular support, and I think it's important to think more about why they did, um, particularly since they were general, often acting against um, the constitutional and democratic rules. Now, what, I, what I'm going to argue is that well before these great charismatic revolutionary leaders came to power, an ideal image of what such a leader should be had already taken shape in Western Enlightenment culture. Figures like Bonaparte in Washington, Toussaint, Bolivar, San Martin, succeeded in large part because they were able to play brilliantly, perform a role that had been sketched out many years before. Obviously, there was a lot of latitude in how the role could be performed. Each of these men, in turn, reshaped it to his own advantage. And I don't mean to say that they were, that they were only doing this, that, that their own abilities counted for, and ideas counted for nothing. Of course, they did. Still, the way they were seen mattered. The, the impression that they gave to the public mattered. And certain key characteristics remained constant. What were these characteristics? First, it was believed that the leader had to embody virtue and of a distinctly classical variety. That is to say, virtue that consisted above all of absolute devotion to the public good in the manner of a hero of the Roman Republic of old, like Cato or Junius Brutus. Secondly, the leader needed to possess extraordinary natural abilities, either mental or physical or both. These natural qualities were deeply bound up with notions of masculinity. The figure was a the leader was a figure of primal masculine power and even fertility. Third, following from the previous two and crucial, he had to be a soldier, someone ready to fight, if necessary, ready to die for his country. He had to be good at war. He had to be a figure of intense military glory. But there was more. Fourth, he had to be capable of refounding or founding for the first time an entire nation of being a true father of his country. And it's worth noting that the phrase father of his country has actually has more than one meaning. It can denote somebody who rules over a people with the tender care that a father shows towards his children. With this meaning, it was used routinely to describe European monarchs. But it can also mean something more like the founding father of the people, the founder from whom the nation itself springs. In this sense, it was used far more sparingly. And finally, one other factor, and a very modern factor. This person had to, this leader had to be someone with whom ordinary citizens or subjects could potentially feel a personal connection. He was not somebody to be admired coolly from a distance. He was someone whose physical features you would be familiar with, often from frequent reproduction, and somebody who you, whom you could read about the way you would read about a character in a novel. In other words, he had to be a celebrity. And the mid-18th century was very much the birthplace of modern forms and ideas of celebrity. And these forms and ideas, in turn, grew out of an Enlightenment-era culture that was as, as obsessed, in fact, with sentiment and sensibility as it was with reason and utility. One final note. This ideal charismatic leader certainly did not, or at least not necessarily, have to hold a royal or noble title or possess any kind of distinguished lineage. He could be a king, but he could also come from the humblest popular stock. His family's identity didn't matter. And it certainly didn't matter that this person, whether or not this person had, was seen to receive any kind of divine blessing or inspiration. He was a child of nature, not a child of God. And while he held the interests of his country paramount, he was not necessarily a Democrat either and not committed to constitutional rules. So, well before Napoleon Bonaparte, several men who embodied these various, what I would call charismatic qualities, had already achieved legendary status in the Western world. And I just want to talk about a couple of them briefly. One of them, you see on the left here, was Peter the Great of Russia, who ruled in the early 18th century. You might not think of him as a revolutionary, but he was seen as revolutionary at the time. He was seen as the man who had worked very hard to modernize Russia and open it up to the West. And because of this, 
He, over the following decades, he became the subject of copious poetry and artwork, and in Western Europe, at least, at least 10 biographies in French, English, and German, including by writers as prominent as Daniel Defoe and Voltaire. So he's one. And a second was an absolutely fascinating man who I've, who I've been working on quite a lot, who's almost completely forgotten today, but also has a very important connection to Napoleon. His name here, you see on the right, was Pascal Paoli. And he actually led the, <clears throat> the island state of Corsica in a fight for independence between the mid-1750s and when he finally lost the battle and Corsica was absorbed into France, to which it still belongs, in 1768. Again, he's entirely forgotten today, but at the time, he had an absolutely enormous European, even American vogue. British Whigs, French philosophes, American revolutionaries alike seized on him as a symbol of liberty. In fact, some of the earliest Sons of Liberty, the patriotic societies in revolutionary America, were called Sons of Corsica, or even Sons of Paoli. <clears throat> in some British novels from the late 1760s, characters speak of volunteering under the brave Paoli, much as Britons of the 1930s spoke of going to fight in Spain. In Paoli's case, interestingly, much of the vogue can be traced to just a single source, the writer James Boswell, the biographer of Samuel Johnson, <clears throat> who spent two weeks visiting Paoli in 1765. He then published a breathless account of the trip that became a bestseller with translations into French, German, Dutch, Italian. And then, most famously of all, and I'll come back to him, there was George Washington as a predecessor to Napoleon. Now, all these men, even the autocratic Peter the Great, were held by their Western admirers to possess the characteristics that I just described. First, they were certainly held to embody classical forms of virtue. They were also praised fulsomely for their natural abilities. They were each, incidentally, unusually tall and strong. Peter the Great was six foot eight, and they were each considered particularly handsome. All of them were hailed for their military ability and their accomplishments, and they were all considered founding fathers. In fact, biographies of both Peter and Paoli use the phrase father of his country in their titles. Washington was re being referred to in America as the father of his country as early as 1778. Peter and Paoli were also particularly praised for supposedly molding primitive, savage peoples into modern nation states. And finally, quite amusingly, all these men can be considered celebrities. Their images circulated in hundreds of printed engravings, figurines, wax statues, even on handkerchiefs, even on dishes. You see there a dish of George Washington on the upper right. Other biographers had a particular penchant for showing the unguarded private version of the person. So Peter, for instance, had traveled through Western Europe in disguise um, <clears throat> while he was Tsar, and this was constantly referred to, you see an engraving of this up here. Or, of course, there's something like George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, stories like that were circulated. And let me quote what the inventor, he was an inventor of this last story, Mason Locke Weems, who wrote an enormously popular biography of George Washington that was published soon after Washington's death, and Weems said, and I quote, it's not in the glare of public but in the shade of private life that we're able to look for the man. Private life is always real life. And this, of course, is the way we justify our present day cult of celebrities, again, looking at their private lives. James Boswell, the biographer of the writer about Paoli, did everything he could to help readers imagine a personal, intimate connection with Paoli. He wrote, and I'm quoting, one morning I remember I came in upon him without ceremony while he was dressing. And I was glad to have an opportunity of seeing him in those teasing moments when, according to the Duke de la Rochefoucauld, no man is a hero to his valet. It wasn't so much of a cliché in 1768. Much of Boswell's book, incidentally, is written in the breathless style of a sentimental novel. So with this background in place, let me come back to Napoleon Bonaparte. When he first attracted public attention and support in France, he fit this new heroic mold perfectly. And let me just give you some biographical background on Napoleon. He was born in Corsica in 1769, so just a year after Paoli's independent Corsican state had been defeated and the French took over the island, and after Paoli himself was forced into exile in London. The defeat was a bitter one for the Corsicans, but it meant that Napoleon was born a French subject, and so his father, as a member of the island's gentry, was able to send him to be educated in one of France's elite military schools. Now, interestingly, despite training for the French army, the adolescent Napoleon was a fierce Corsican patriot, and he was particularly obsessed with the exiled Paoli, whom he read about in the Italian translation of Boswell, interestingly enough, 
because he was, Napoleon was a native Italian speaker. The Corsicans speak a dialect of Italian, or they did at the time, rather than French. Now, after graduating in 1785, Napoleon received a commission in the French artillery. But when the French Revolution began, four years later, he returned to Corsica and quickly became embroiled in the island's turbulent politics. Paoli returned home from exile the same year. Initially, the two were on the same side, the old independence fighter and the young admirer. But pretty soon, the Bonapartes and, the, and Paoli were feuding. And in 1793, the Bonapartes lost the feud and had to flee to mainland France. From that point on, Napoleon gave up his Corsican loyalties, although he never gave up his thick Corsican accent, and he identified as French. And he quickly made a reputation for himself as part of the military force that successfully recaptured the port city of Toulon from the British. Two years later, he played a key role defending the revolutionary government in Paris from royalist rioters, and that success led him to the nomination as general-in-chief commanding France's Army of Italy. He was just 27 years old and one of the three or four most highest, highest ranking generals in the French army. But despite his youth and inexperience, he turned out to be an absolutely brilliant field commander, indeed one of the great military geniuses of history. In the spring of 1796, he led his army into Italy, and within a matter of weeks, he defeated the forces of the Italian Kingdom of Savoy. Then, in a remarkable nine-month campaign, he decisively outfought France's main adversary, the Austrian Empire, and forced it into a peace settlement that left the French in control of most of northern Italy, something they had been trying to do for centuries. These feats made Napoleon a hero back in France, and he did what he could to further strengthen his reputation. He founded not one, but two newspapers, which reported back on his successes to the French public, and he happily posed for artists who wanted to glorify him, especially the young Antoine Jean Gros, who painted the spectacular picture you see on the left of Napoleon's heroism at the Battle of Arcola. And I told the story this afternoon, I'll tell it again, it's a great story, that <clears throat> Josephine, Napoleon's wife, accompanied him to Italy at the end of the campaign, and when Gros wanted to paint this picture, Napoleon was so fidgety that he couldn't stand still for it. Napoleon, Josephine bent down and grabbed him around the legs and said, be still, and Gros was able to paint the picture. Now, all of this happened as the French Revolutionary Republic, born out of the Revolution of 1789, was becoming dangerously unstable. It was lurching from coup d'etat to coup d'etat. Napoleon was already thinking of trying to seize power, although first there was a detour. In 1798, he led an expedition that conquered Egypt for France. That campaign, unlike the Italian one, eventually turned disastrous. The British destroyed the French fleet in the Mediterranean. They cut off the expedition from its home base. But the French public didn't realize the extent of the catastrophe for several years. And by that point, Napoleon had already returned home back to France, evading British pursuit. Once home in the fall of 1799, he entered into a conspiracy with several leading politicians. They'd become convinced that only a powerful general could now restore stability to France. And in early November, the date by the revolutionary calendar was the 18th of Brumaire, Napoleon seized his power with the support of the French army. He then outmaneuvered his fellow conspirators to become the so-called first consul of France with quasi-dictatorial powers. He was now 30 years old. So, what was the image of Napoleon that circulated in France during this crucial period when he rose to prominence, the period of the Italian and Egyptian campaigns? First, he was portrayed as a figure of uncommon Republican patriotism and virtue. And in fact, there's another French newspaper of the period, not sponsored by him, that was actually called Journal of Bonaparte and Virtuous Men. You can see the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the newspaper right there. He was frequently compared to figures from classical history and myth, as in the illustration you see here, Napoleon, a medal of him with Hannibal, the, the, um, <coughs> Le Cid, and Alexander the Great. Secondly, he was seen as a figure of extraordinary natural gifts. Nobody ever said he was tall. But he actually wasn't unusually short either. That's actually a myth spread by British propagandists, a very successful effort in propaganda, because everybody thinks he was very short. He was actually just a little below average height for the period. But if he was not seen as being extraordinary physically, he was seen as being extraordinarily mentally, as a genius, and also as a man of extraordinary physical bravery, which was actually true. Uh, this was how one of his tame newspapers described him. I'm just going to quote the newspaper. He flies like lightning and strikes like thunder. 
The speed of his movements is matched only by their accuracy and prudence. He's everywhere. He sees everything. Like a comet cleaving the clouds, he appears at the same moment on the astonished banks of two separate rivers. And the same point was conveyed by the visual portraits, which portrayed him as strikingly handsome, windblown, a pure emanation of nature, most famously in Jacques-Louis David's famous painting of 1801 on every, everybody's cognac bottle that you see there on the right. And needless to say, he was portrayed as the very incarnation of military glory and success, something I will come back to. Even before he took power in 1799, Napoleon's propagandists routinely described him as the savior of France. And once he was actually in power, this language became ubiquitous. He never formally took the title of father of his country, probably because it would have reminded people too much of his Bourbon predecessors. But he was often referred to as it anyway. And his propagandists and admirers often called him le héros régénérateur, the hero who regenerated France, who literally gave it new life. And he was definitely a celebrity. Even before he took power in 1799, there were over 150 separate engraved portraits of him that had been produced and sold throughout Europe. You can see a selection here, and you can see quite obviously what it is like to make portraits in an age before the age of photography. Obviously, most were not done from life. In some cases, the artists were obviously just purely inventing because they had no idea of what he looked like. But they were all sold under the, at least under the claim that this is what Napoleon Bonaparte looks like, and that meant that his face, or at least what people thought was his face, was familiar throughout the continent. And while the artists tended to portray him quite formally, he was also the subject of stage plays, among other things, and stories that emphasized his personal qualities, his loyalty to friends, his courage um, <clears throat> with, with his fellow soldiers, his, his, his attitude with, with, the, with, the, with the soldiers who served under him. Stories circulated, particularly within the French army, that emphasized the easygoing manner he had with his soldiers and, the re and his readiness to fight by their sides and to do the kind of thing that a French king would have turned down his nose at. It was widely reported, for instance, that at the Battle of Lodi in May of 1796, Napoleon, who was, after all, a former artillery officer, actually stepped in himself to help load a cannon at the decisive moment. And after the battle, the sol his soldiers joked that because of this he was done well, they would elect him a corporal. And that's where he got his nickname, the little corporal, le petit caporal, that stuck with him. All these things allowed the French to imagine an intense personal connection with him. So for all, in all these ways, he fit the model of the charismatic revolutionary leader that had been associated with Peter the Great, with Pauli, with George Washington. Again, it didn't, help, it didn't hurt that he very genuinely possessed at least some of the characteristics associated with the model. He may not have been particularly virtuous. He was not. But he was indeed a military genius and inarguably, during this period at least, an incredible military success. But he quite consciously molded his image to fit the model, and he quite clearly had his predecessors in mind. As I've already noted, he was obsessed from his earliest years with Pauli. As for George Washington, Washington died, in fact, by coincidence, just a month after Napoleon took power, and Napoleon made full use of the occasion. He ordered memorial services held for Washington in Paris. He ordered the French to observe a lengthy mourning period for George Washington. Obviously, the goal was to associate the two men in the public eye. A writer and orator named Louis de Fontaine developed, uh, sorry, delivered a lengthy eulogy for Washington in Napoleon's presence. And he drew the parallel very explicitly, although he couldn't resist saying, well, Napoleon is actually a better general. What, do you, what can you expect? Um, he said, Napoleon is a man who, while still young, has surpassed Washington in war. All right. Now, <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, historians have long recognized that Napoleon did, in fact, enjoy genuine popular support in France, especially in the years immediately after he took power. He was not a dictator ruling by force. Soon after his coup d'etat, and again in 1802, he held plebiscites to legitimate his rule, and he won an actual majority of the votes, even if the interior minister, who in the first case happened to be named Lucien Bonaparte and was his brother, tampered with the results to make the endorsement look even more impressive. He may have wielded quasi-dictatorial powers, but again, he didn't rule simply by force. So the representations of him, the image of him that circulated, the legend that he had, none of this can be dismissed simply as empty propaganda. It found a very willing audience. What I've been trying to show in laying out the way these representations were constructed is that the support for him didn't simply arise, again, out of a kind of primitive longing for a strong man, and it didn't arise out of a longing for a return a return of the king, a return of the traditional French monarchy. 
Yes, he won accolades because he promised to bring peace, stability, prosperity, and victory to a country that had been racked by a decade of revolutionary toil and that had been threatened at several moments by invasion. But at the same time, he embodied this very particular and very modern sort of personal authority that had been forged within Enlightenment culture and that was associated with the predecessors I've talked about. And it was very much a personal quality. It was, it was associated with, his, with him as a person rather than with the office he held, rather than with the, not with the family he belonged to, and not with any kind of religious sanction that he might have received. So what I'd like to suggest is that the status as a charismatic revolutionary leader, with the specific characteristics that I've laid out, served as the way that he was able to come to power, and then it served as legitimating principle of the regime he created and the regime he led from 1799 on. And I think this is also an important point, to think about the ways in which revolutionary regimes at this point got public legitimation. This is a period when democratic constitutional regimes were still very new throughout the world, very unstable, very fragile things in this period. Even in the United States, where, you know, where we were very lucky to have the leadership we did during the revolution, but when even in the election of 1800, people were predicting civil war. And under the conditions that prevailed in France after the revolution, things were much more fragile and unstable. In a period like this, the idea of personal rule by a charismatic leader was not simply something to fall back on when democratic structures collapsed. It amounted to an alternate form of legitimacy to the emerging constitutional orders, and at times a very attractive alternative for many people. Napoleon was certainly careful to justify his seizure of power in 1799 as constitutional, you see here the proclamation that he issued to the people upon taking power, and there on the right is the first constitution that he devised for France, and it was ratified by the plebiscite I mentioned. Then, five years later, he looked for a different form of legitimization by having himself crowned by the Pope in Paris as emperor. Um, and you see here the great picture by Jacques-Louis David of this coronation. But as he himself recognized, neither of these justifications for his rule were really sufficient there's a story that when a summary of the new constitution was first read to a crowd in Paris, a man couldn't follow it and ask what it meant, and a woman replied to him, it means Bonaparte. Everybody knew that the constitutions were mostly window dressing for an authoritarian regime, and as for the new monarchy that he founded in 1804, well, it lacked the weight of tradition and it lacked um, so much that the other European monarchs relied on. And Napoleon himself realized this point very keenly. Just when he was already deciding to make himself emperor in May of 1803, he said the following to one of his counselors, and I'm quoting, you have to remember that I am not like those divinely anointed kings who regard their states as an inheritance. Their power is supported by long-standing custom. With me, by contrast, long-standing customs are just obstacles. My government needs brilliant actions and therefore war. I repeat, I'm still quoting Napoleon, I repeat, a newborn government like mine needs to amaze and astonish people in order to consolidate himself. So for Napoleon, in other words, it might be fine to have a crown of gold and jewels, like the one that he was crowned with here, but what really mattered most was the crown of laurels that classical antiquity had bestowed upon its most brilliant victors, on the doers of great deeds, rather than on the owners of royal pedigrees. And it's no surprise, you can see all the different depictions of Napoleon being crowned with laurels, that he was so often depicted as having this other sort of coronation. The Napoleonic regime privileged glory above all other qualities. And so we have to take glory seriously, not just as a source of fame, but as, in fact, a kind of political principle. The great civic festivals of the period all centered on the exaltation of military glory, such as in the ritual distribution of eagle standards to Napoleon's regiments, or the reburial of France's greatest military heroes in the Church of the Invalides in Paris, where he himself is now buried. The great architectural projects that he sponsored had the same purpose. And you see some of the famous architectural projects that he at least began here and that still stand in Paris, including the Vendôme Column, constructed partly out of the cannon of his defeated enemies. He offered glory as the principal incentive binding ordinary French people to his regime. And particularly deserving subjects could even hope for the ultimate recognition of their glory, namely membership in the Legion of Honor that it created. Napoleon saw glory as a way of bringing the French together, as the historian Robert Morrissey has said, of reconciling in his person the old regime and the French Revolution. And of course, the defining standard against which everybody else's glory would be measured was Napoleon. It was actually, in its way, a kind of bold venture. 
to organize a society on a basis other than tradition or religious observance, or the kind of abstract political principles beloved of constitution makers like the French revolutionaries. There was nothing cold and abstract about his cult of glory. In his regime, again, the, the population would be bound together not by abstract rules, not by traditional habits of obedience, not by divine sanction, but by intense emotion focused on the person of the charismatic leader. Let me quote briefly how the chief judge of Napoleon's court of appeal justified the creation of the, of the Napoleonic empire in 1804. I'm quoting. And it's pretty, 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 pretty purple stuff. Napoleon stands beyond human history. He belongs to the time of heroes. He is beyond all admiration. The only thing that can rise to his level is love. And yet, in the final analysis, this venture was also desperately fragile. It was fragile because in practice, the quality of glory that Napoleon placed such weight on was actually more narrowly military glory. Napoleon did gesture towards expanding the definition. When he founded the Legion of Honor in 1802, he said the following, if this honor only goes to the military, then France will no longer amount to anything. But in fact, fully 97% of the 48,000 people who got the Legion's coveted ribbon before 1815, before his fall, came from the army. In official state ceremonies, marshals of France had the right to walk ahead of even the highest civilian officials. In his government, even many civilian officials wore uniforms based on military ones. And in his new all-male elite high schools, the lycées, boys were organized into companies commanded by sergeants. They wore uniforms. They walked to class to the sound of drumbeats, underwent military training, and listened to endless lectures on honor, patriotism, and duty to Napoleon. The cult of glory was, in practice, a cult of the French army. And as I said this afternoon in my other talk, Napoleon's regime, while not a military one, in the sense that the army ruled, because the army didn't rule itself, was nonetheless deeply militaristic. And for this reason, it was also dependent, in the final analysis, on unending war, and more than this, on unending victory. An unending victory was one thing Napoleon Bonaparte finally could not deliver on. So let me finish by picking up his story again and returning to the military history. In 1800, soon after taking power, Napoleon led his, the French armies back into Italy and again defeated the Austrians there at the Battle of Marengo. <clears throat> this was a victory that solidified his political position in Paris. It allowed him to become a monarch in all but name in 1802 as consul for life and then emperor two years later. In 1805, he defeated the combined forces of Austria and Russia and Pro in, the, in his most famous victory of all at Austerlitz. And the year after that, he inflicted an absolutely stunning defeat on the German kingdom of Prussia. There seemed to be no limits to his power. The boundaries of his empire swelled, eventually to incorporate much of Western Europe. The rest of the continent west of Russia was almost entirely subservient to him. But one of the arguments that I'm making in my new biography is that as early as 1805, he was actually losing control of events. It was not just his need for brilliant deeds or his outside ego, or his outsized ego that was pushing him into ever more intensive military campaigns, what I've elsewhere called the first total war. He was also trapped by a problem of strategy, above all the problem of how to confront his greatest enemy, Great Britain. The fact was that for all of France's military strength on land, and for all Napoleon's genius as a land commander, <clears throat> none of this could overcome Britain's advantage at sea. At sea, France was fatally weak. It could build ships, it could put men in sailors' uniforms, but a powerful navy required another ex important ingredient, namely naval expertise. And here the French fell desperately short. Even the lowest ranking sailor in the age of sail required far more skill and experience than an ordinary land soldier. Officers required years of specialized training in order to navigate and maneuver ships that were, of course, moved by dozens of separate sails and, and had dozens of cannon on board. British naval officers often started at sea as early as age eight. Throughout this period, even the British Navy needed to impress, which is to say forcibly conscript, roughly half its sailors, but it could do so from its own merchant marine, which had lots of experienced seamen. France had a much less well-developed maritime tradition, and it simply could not match the British in this area. In some Napoleonic naval battles, incredibly, half the sailors had never been to sea before, and so the expertise mattered. And all of this meant that Napoleon, despite his burning desire to invade Britain in 1803, 1804, it would have been the ultimate brilliant deed for a French leader, he simply could not do so. 
to protect the invasion flotilla that he wanted to build from the British Navy, he needed a navy of his own, and the British were keeping it bottled up far to the south. The English Channel might as well have been the Pacific Ocean for all the good it did him. Finally, in the fall of 1805, he did order the fleets of France and its allies Spain out into the Atlantic, come what may. On October 21st, 1805, just almost exactly 210 years ago, they confronted the British fleet under Lord Nelson at Trafalgar off the Spanish coast. The French and British actually had more ships, a quarter more ships than the British, but the British naval expertise counted for much more. France's Admiral Villeneuve used the classic naval technique of assembling his ships into one long, long, easily controlled line. Nelson organized his ships into two great, flexible, maneuverable columns, a feat that required all the naval expertise that he and his men could muster. They then sailed directly into the Franco-Spanish line, breaking it. Nelson died heroically during the battle, but Villeneuve lost more than half his ships and thousands of sailors. This was really the turning point for Napoleon. He could continue to win on land, but he no longer had a chance of defeating Britain at sea. His only hope of defeating Britain now was to destroy it economically, which he thought he could do by cutting off British trade with the European continent. This was a big source of British wealth in the period. But to do that, he would have had to exert an unprecedented degree of control over the entire European continent. He would have had to patrol its entire huge coastline to prevent British goods from entering. And this was an impossible task but it led him into greater and greater commitments on land, and ultimately these commitments stretched French resources to the breaking point. Already in 1807, he found it frustratingly difficult even to bring a new campaign against Russia to conclusion. It was marked by the hideous draw that was the Battle of Eylau. You can see here on the right, this battle was fought in freezing conditions. It was captured by the same artist who had painted him so gloriously 10 years before, Antoine Jean Gros. And you can see here, this painting makes a pretty stunning contrast to the portrait of the young and glorious and triumphant Napoleon that I showed you a few minutes ago. The need to shut off the continent to Britain also led to the long, disastrous war in Spain that bled the British army white. So by 1812, even though Napoleon's empire looked bigger than ever before on land, the size was actually a measure of weakness, not of strength. It was not a sign of ever-growing conquest. It was like the skin of a, of a rotten piece of fruit that was about to burst open. And then came 1812. In that year, Napoleon put together the largest army ever seen on European soil and led it to almost total destruction in Russia. And just two years after that, the Allies were able to invade France itself. And when this happened, Napoleon's regime finally collapsed. He did manage to resurrect it briefly a year later in the episode of the Hundred Days, but was defeated again at Waterloo. So let me again come back to what I tried to make the main argument of this lecture. Napoleon's regime depended for its survival in France, above all on his charismatic authority, on his cult of glory, and the way he fit the model of charisma and glory that had developed in the West over the course of the 18th century. In 1799, these things brought him to power. But in 1814, and again in 1815, they evaporated, and the French were willing to accept even the disgraced Bourbon dynasty back to the throne. Napoleon himself recognized this point very clearly later in his life. In 1816, he said the following to Emmanuel de las Casas, if you remember his secretary, so to speak, the man who wrote up the memorial of St. Helena. Napoleon said, I was the key, said to him, I was the keystone of a structure that was not just brand new, but it was built on such shaky foundations. Its survival depended upon each one of my battles. When the battles were lost, the structure dissolved into sand. But by the point Napoleon made this admission, he was no longer in France. He was on St. Helena, where I started this story, where he arrived 200 years ago this week, and the only battle he had left to fight was the battle of his reputation. Thank you very much. to take questions. I think there are microphones around here, and I think I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, John, if you could call on people, because the lights are shining in my eyes, and I can't actually see any of you. So, it would be, so I can't call on people myself. So if you would. Thank you for this excellent, uh, brilliant presentation. We need it here in Montana. Uh, could you briefly address
uh, this pa uh, uh, Napoleonic paradox. No, On the, the one hand... The paradox? Yes. Yes, and uh, I just want your reaction very briefly. Uh, on the one hand, he's a man who hijacked the power, the energy of the revolution, like a technique, uh, an earthquake, just channel it, and project it all over Europe, uh, use, using imperialism, chauvinism, nationalism, etc. But some historians say that, on the other hand, without this, the ideas of 1789 of the Enlightenment would have never been spread out throughout Europe. In fact, some historians say, like, if he had been succeeding uh, in Russia, perhaps the Bolshevik Revolution, good or bad, I don't know, would have been avoided. So could you speak about this paradox, like the idea of the revolution spread out through what is contradictory to revolutions, that is to say, imperialism and nationalism? Well, I would say, I mean, again, the question about whether you know, Napoleon sort of, whether Napoleon destroyed the French Revolution or whether he spread its principles throughout Europe. Um, I think this is partly, there's a tendency in France often to see, as the great French statements, statesman Clemenceau once said, that the revolution is a block, you have to take it as a whole. Um, and so you, you talk about the ideas of the French Revolution, but you don't have to talk about the ideas of the French Revolution, because there are many of them. And there were some that Napoleon certainly betrayed and traduced. The idea of, of the idea of liberty, for instance, the idea also of liberty extended to all people. One of the things Napoleon did um, quite infamously in 1802 was actually after the French Revolution had abolished slavery and emancipated the slaves in the French colonies, and there were as many French slaves in the French colonies at this period as there were in the entire United States, um, Napoleon re-established re slavery. So there are certain forms of French revolutionary ideas that he certainly did not um, adhere to. But there was a, a revolutionary principle of civic equality. The, one of Napoleon's great accomplishments, the Napoleonic Code, the law code, which is now all, not just the law code for France, but for many countries, and even in part for the state of Louisiana in the United States, embodies the principle of civic equality. That principle he did spread very effectively across Europe. One of the things that he did in, in many places was to knock down the walls of ghettos. So the Jews who had been, been confined to small ghettos found themselves granted equal rights. He helped to destroy the power, the power of powerful Catholic institutions. So I think as long as we don't see the ideas of the French Revolution as a block, but as long as we're willing to see what Napoleon did spread throughout Europe and what he did not, I think we can answer the question that way. Um, your mention of civic equality and Napoleon spreading civic, civic equality, could you talk a bit of um, the situation of women under Napoleon's civic equality? I should have said civic equality for men. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, the Napoleonic Code is noted for its very strong reinforcement of gender roles, for its reinforcement of the role of the, of, of the husband as the head of the family. Um, of course, you know, France, in part because of this heritage, France was very late to give women the right to vote. It gave women the right to vote in 1944. Um, people often forget this, but in, in, you know, the, the women in France were not able to, to publish publish a word without the signature of their husbands if they were married until 1965. Um, so, and all this is a result of the Napoleonic Code. So civic equality, but civic equality for heads of household rather than for all citizens, I think, would be the way I would answer that. Anyone else? Does the Napoleonic experience give France a sort of inoculation against young, charismatic, concentrated leadership? When I look at the, from the mid-19th century on, I view French leaders as rather gray establishmentarian types and somewhat resistant, the ant antithesis of Napoleonic leadership. So does the whole experience of kind of inoculate France against trying that in the future or your observation? I'm not sure entirely. I mean, the French Revolution was, was, was a particular period when, you know, young generals came, certainly um, had amazing careers, and Napoleon, you know, becoming a general at, at you know, a top general 27 was not, even, was not even the youngest at the time. Um, so, so generally, the later periods did not have people so young, but, somebody, but there, were, there were plenty of political figures who were not actually that, that, that old when they threatened to take power. General Boulanger in the late 19th century, very important political figure who might easily have become the sort of paramount leader, was not, was not, particularly, was not particularly old. And even Charles de Gaulle, 
Um, while he certainly we remember him today as, as the sort of the, the stiff gray guy, um, you know, in 1940, in 1930, 1940, when he first came to prominence with his appeal to the French to resist, he was he was still fairly young himself. Although, you know, he always he always you know he he was he never really came off as a young person. I'm not sure he was ever young in spirit, De Gaulle. So I'd say maybe partly, but uh, I, I think we shouldn't take it too far. I would say. Hmm. Yes. Do you see um, any of the American? Uh, military leaders as being charismatic, authoritative type leaders. Uh, the only one I can think of is probably Colin Powell is the closest we have. Can you think of anyone we, that comes to your mind that fits all of those characteristics? Well, historically, the person who comes closest to this, I mean, we have a lot. I mean, we have Andrew, we have Andrew Jackson. Uh, who was certainly had that this very much the same kind of reputation in many ways, also a celebrity in very much the same ways. Um, we might have we might have had President McClellan in 1864. Who, what was his nickname? The young Napoleon. Um, you know, more recently, uh, we have certainly had many you know many generals who have been very prominent in American politics. One just has to think about Dwight Eisenhower, obviously. Um, you know, most recently, obviously, David Petraeus is probably the person who might have come closest, but mm, a little scandal uh, took away from his reputation, and he wasn't able to make it into politics. So one could very easily imagine the kind of alternate, you know, sort of course of events where he, where he, you know, particularly given the Republican field this year, might have looked very, very impressive in there. But who knows? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much, thank you for coming.